What a pleasure to be with you this morning as Pastor Fred, who's welcome. I greatly appreciate an invitation to be with you. My name is David Vasquez-Levy, and I serve as president at Pacific School of Religion, your seminary on Holy Hill, just uh, on the other side of the hills here in Berkeley. It is a pleasure to be here at Hillcrest and to be able to bring a personal word of thanks for the ministry this congregation has done in partnering with PSR, both in the development of leadership for the church and in the service of our alums within your congregation. I'm particularly grateful for the role the congregation has played here at Hillcrest in helping to prepare the next generation of leaders. Now, as you host David, as your pirate in chief, or whatever it is he's doing these days, uh, <laughs> but, uh, it is only in the partnership with the church that we are able to prepare leadership for the church. 18 months after the final battle of the Civil War, and within years of the discovery of gold in Sutter Mill, an event that sparked what the Alameda County record describes as the most heterogeneous mass of humanity ever assembled since the confusion of tongues. I got to repeat that. It's a great phrase. It's in the record. The most heterogeneous mass of humanity. The discovery of gold that led to the gold rush brought people from everywhere, creating this mass of humanity unprecedented since the Confucian of Tongues, a reference to the Tower of Babel. So 18 months after the final battle of the Civil War, still in the wake of the gold rush, and within just two years of the completion of the first transcontinental railroad that would connect east to west as the golden rod, or the golden spike rather, was driven in, making a journey that used to take months to go from east to west into a matter of weeks. It is into that setting that Pacific School of Religion was founded. Out of the conviction that leaders could no longer just be prepared out east and shipped here, because something was happening in this part of the country that would soon shape the rest of the nation, with all of these people coming together from everywhere, with the kind of innovation that was happening here. Today, brothers and sisters, silicon has replaced gold, bringing people from all over the world to our corner of the world. Rather than connected by a golden spike, we are connected by the touch of a screen, not just across the country, but around the world. And the level of division we have witnessed in our presidential election highlights the kinds of divisions we are living with that at times feel like those that led our nation to an internal conflict. The need today to prepare theologically and spiritually rooted leaders is as great as it was at the founding of PSR 150 years ago. And this setting, where we live, continues to be the place where this kind of preparation should happen. A place that is shaped by the innovation of Silicon Valley, by the legacy of the Bay Area, whether it's Oakland or San Francisco, that has shaped so many of the social movements of our lifetimes, and by the deeply rooted realities of the Central Valley, where we are connected by immigrant labor to the whole world and to the earth by the very food we produce because no matter how advanced we become, we continue to eat from the earth and depend on the rain to bring forth the fruit of the earth. It is into this partnership that I am grateful to receive and welcome you, thank you for your partnership, and invite our reflection on the texts that are before us. Please join me in a word of prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our God and our Redeemer. So we heard a couple of readings. Let me focus first on the reading from Elijah, about Elijah in 1 Kings, and say a few words first about Elijah so we had a bit of context as we heard already Jim share for us. See, Elijah was a prophet, of course, he was up there. He was one of the top prophets. He was literally up there 
with Moses and Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration, representing the prophets as Moses represented the law. If there had been action figures back in early Israel life, little children at Halloween in Israel would have wanted to get action figures of Elijah. That's how popular he was. He's the one who got to ride the original Harley Davidson up into heaven. Now, those early witnesses confused it with a chariot of fire, but that's understandable, not having seen a motorcycle beforehand. He's the one, as we heard, who confronted the priest of Baal, challenging them to a prophet-type duel and coming out ahead. He managed to get God to send fire from heaven. Now, unfortunately, things didn't always go so well for Elijah. King Ahab and his wife Jezebel were not too happy that Elijah had in one fell swoop dismantled their very profitable Baals are Oz empire. They were making a pretty penny controlling the nation and the resources of it through a false understanding of the divine the story takes place today in a valley, not in one of those mountaintop experiences that Elijah had from time to time, up on the mountain of transfiguration, up on the mountain confronting the priest of Baal in a fiery storm, or up on another mountain on Mount Horeb where he encounters God in the silence. But today's story is not on a mountaintop when things are going great, but rather in a valley in a low point, both figuratively and literally for him. Then Elijah was afraid, we hear. He got up and fled for his life. He came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah. He ran for the border because of his fear. He left his servant there, but he himself went in a day's journey into the wilderness. He came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. Staggering along the Sonora Desert, Martin Lopez would run to where he thought he saw water, but find nothing. Later, he thought he saw someone walking ahead of him, but it too was just an illusion. Exhausted, he collapsed under the first reprieve he found from the scorching heat. For a moment, he thought, this bush will be my grave. As he wavered between sleep and consciousness, he thought of Julia, his bride of only one year. And imagine what his firstborn child would look like. It was the news that he and Julia were expecting that finally convinced Martin to go for it and travel al otro lado, to the other side, hoping against hope that he would be able to build for his soon-to-be-born child a future better than his own. But now under this tr the shade of this bush, he, like thousands before him, regretted the decision to migrate, not for the last time, Elijah went a day's journey into the wilderness. He asked that he might die. It is enough, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he laid down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Like Martin Lopez, and like hundreds of others, Forced to venture across dangerous terrains, Elijah is running for his life. The authorities pursuing him are not La Migra, immigrations and customs enforcements, but those who are pursuing him on behalf of the local government share the same arsenal of fear. Elijah, who just days beforehand went against the law of the land, he confronted the authorities of the time now feels that he must run for his life. He contends with God, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. More worn out than afraid, Elijah collapses under a solitary broom tree. 
And then something happens that happens often in the scriptures and maybe not in other places. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, get up and eat. He looked and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. Barely waking from his stupor, under the meager shade of a bush in the Sonora Desert, Martin Lopez saw something green and bright in the distance. Almost sure that it was nothing more than another mirage, he nonetheless summoned the strength he had left to stumble toward it. And then, as if afraid that it would disappear, he devoured the zucchinis he found growing in that unlikely place. The moisture and sustenance he drew both from the fruit and the very leaves of that plant were enough to help Martin survive his desert crossing. I heard Martin's story sitting in his living room 20 years after it happened. As I sat with him in his home in the Yakima Valley in Washington State, where he has, for the last 25 years, together with his family, picked the cherries and apples many of us eat in our, can buy just in our local grocery store. To this day, he joked, I can't even look at zucchinis. Every day. Every day, angels join Martin's zucchinis and Elijah's hot cakes by placing gallons of water out in the desert. Life-given water for those who run from violence and poverty in hopes of a better future, convinced that they, too, deserve at least the crumbs that fall off the global table we have set for ourselves. This is a global phenomenon of people forced to venture across boundaries, a day's journey into the wilderness, escaping the growing violence in Syria, risking their lives to make their way from Africa into Europe, following the historical trade lines of the colonies, riding dangerous trains that bring children to our country undocumented and unaccompanied. How do we deal with this? It is God's angels who meet folks, whether it is out in the wide open sea, whether it is in the borders of Europe or throughout our country, meeting them in free clinics, in English classes, in food pantries like the ones that are held right here in this congregation. From its founding, this congregation knows well, Hellcrest knows well what it means to be a voice in the community for those who find themselves across a margin, beyond a place of hope. Those who find themselves displaced or on the move, unable to provide for what they need, out in a desert and a wilderness. This congregation has seen that need double since 2008 when the economy turned and has sought ways to be like that angel that came to Elijah and invite people by saying, come and eat. Out in the desert on the way to Mount Horeb, the angel of God, however, comes to Elijah not just once, but if you notice this, twice. Sounding awfully much like my mother when the grandkids are at Abuela's table, the angel of God refills Elijah's plate and says to him, Go on, boy, put some meat on those bones. Or well, as first king reports it, get up and eat. Otherwise, the journey will be too much for you. That's second helping kind of ministry. The kind that Jesus had in mind when he said, I have come so that you may have life and have it abundantly. See, the first helping is so that Elijah can live. But the second helping is so that he can live abundantly. Jesus was all about 
abundant second helping kind of ministry. Like serving wine by the bathtub at the wedding at Cana so that the party could go on for some time. Second helping kind of ministry that sends us back to those overfished waters when we are convinced that we have tried everything and returns us with a boat full to the brim. Abundant second helping kind of ministry like feeding 5,000 abuelas style, making sure that there is enough in it to make do with what's in the fridge, not only to fill everyone's needs, but to have 12 baskets left over so everybody can take a doggy bag home. Second helping kind of ministry that in the face of scarcity says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The angel of God wakes Elijah up and helps him to survive. And then he wakes him up a second time and tells him that survival is not enough, that God is not done with him yet. Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. Brothers and sisters, the church knows a lot about that first helping, the one that helps people get over the hump, that helps us to survive. But we have a ways to go to learn from the angel, Jesus, and Grandma to heap on a second helping, to act in charity, which is central to survival, but also with justice, without which abundant life is just not possible. The angel of God comes to us and says, get up and eat at this table. We gather to consecrate the work of the fields. The wine we consecrate here was likely made from grapes picked by undocumented immigrants right around us here. And we say that labor on this table becomes the very body and blood of Jesus. Get up and eat when we feel that we are unsure what the future of the church looks like. Get up and eat within this gathered community across the ages and around the world. Get up and eat in the thinking faith that gathers every morning in this congregation to ask those tough questions. I overheard the last part of the discussion this morning where someone said, you know, it's easy to find the answers we are told online, but it is the questions that matter most. Get up and eat to discern your calling, to figure out what the harvest of your lifetime, as one of the ministries of the congregation invites you to do, what does second helping kind of retirement look like? Where we recognize that certainly life changes with every stage, but can continue to be redefined. The angel of God comes to us, wakes us up, and calls us not only to acknowledge the world as it is, but to transform it into the vision we pray for when we say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is enough, O Lord, said Elijah, feeling that he wasn't quite sure in that valley what lied ahead. I am no better than... My ancestors, he says, aware of the legacy behind him, unsure as to what laid ahead. But to him, the angel of God comes and says, get up and eat. On the strength of that food, we are told, he went 40 days and 40 nights to, the, to Mount Horeb, the Mount of God. Pacific School of Religion in partnership with you and with congregations around the region and around the world, is committed to developing leaders who can envision that second helping kind of ministry. A ministry that imagines the world as it could be. Leaders who have the capacity to think in complex ways and in large picture about the issues of our day and the passions of their life. 
and who have the capacity to develop and sustain those ministries. You have experienced that kind of leadership here in this congregation, and I am inviting you to be a part of it more fully, to have the opportunity to join us as we join God's angel, Jesus and Grandma, in serving a second helping in a time that is in desperate need of that kind of leadership. Like Elijah, we can look at the ministry of the church in all of its uncertainties and feel that our best days, personally, as a church or as an institution or as a country, lie behind us. Yet, the leadership this congregation needs, that our church needs, that our world needs, is leadership that can sit at the table, get up and eat so that we may be strengthened. I don't know if you know what seminary means, not cemetery, as my uh, wife often would say as a child to her mom. The word seminary comes from the image of a seedbed, a place where seeds are planted, little starting plants are grown before they are brought out and planted elsewhere. In that sense of seminary, it isn't just a place to grow pastors. But it is broadly, as PSR has been from its beginning, a place to prepare leadership for the church and the society. I invite you to consider whatever stage of life you are in, what theological education might help do to frame your own sense of calling, to think about people in this congregation, yourself included, about how theological education might help you frame the passions you have in your life to make a difference in the world and to develop the kind of spiritual deep-rootedness that can help you to sustain it. I want to invite you into conversation with us shortly today after worship, but to come and visit Holy Hill, your seedbed, the seminary place, that hopes to grow the kind of leader that the church and the society needs in every aspect of it. Pray for this ministry and our shared ministry together. Consider theological education and commit your support, financial and otherwise, to this important task of raising leaders who are second helping kind of leaders. From the world news to the challenges in our own lives, we, like Elijah, have plenty of reason to feel worn out at times. But God's angel come to us like he came to Elijah and says, get up and eat. Just remember that word has it that on the strength of that food, he went 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. Amen.